Okay, please join me. Let's please rise as we read our passage <coughs> this morning. <coughs> we are in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16. Let's begin. In all circumstances, of the evil one. God bless the reading of this word. Please be seated. Um, as I was praying at the, the pastor's office this morning, I was uh, beautifully distracted by the laughter of, um, of uh, the men's IBS. And I thought, what a great reminder because, well, that's what it's about, right? We are discussing, and if we can close the door, please, at the back. Um, as we're discussing spiritual warfare, the laughter reminded me that this is great joy to speak of because it's a battle that's been won. We are already victorious in it, right? We are just understanding how we can further glorify the Lord through these battles. But he's already won them. And so thank you, men, uh, IBS, um, for uh, the encouragement. I wish I, was, uh, I could tune in more. So let's begin, uh, verse 16a. Uh, let's begin in verse 16a. In all circumstances, in all circumstances, so, so far, the Lord has allowed us to go through how many armor pieces already? Three. Um, and, and they would cover perhaps what, what, uh, uh, what I heard one of you saying uh, were vital organs, right, or, or vital pieces. Um, the formal term for this would be integuments, uh, integuments, so that we can refer to these first three armor pieces as integuments. So first is the belt of truth, and this is the word and all the truths contained in it. Next is the breastplate of righteousness and the covering vital organs such as the lungs and the heart as an illustration because apart from the imputed righteousness of Christ unto his children, we would never be able to live righteously for him. Then last week, the shoes were our readiness to express, to answer, and, and even to proclaim the gospel, which has brought us true peace, and ultimately where true peace can come from. This morning, we begin with the more obvious uh, defensive pieces. While we lump the first three as part of the defensive armor pieces, this next two are are more obvious in terms of their defensive piece, right? And so we begin with a shield of faith. If you have an ESV, actually, just to check, if you raise your hand, do you have an ESV? Raise your hand, ESV. All right, more or less 50%. If you have an ESV, it would read in all, correct? In all. Uh, if you have the NASB, or the NIV, you would read, in addition to. But if you read the King James Version, it would read, above all. Above all, taking up the shield of faith, or taking up the shield of faith, those are two different things, huh? Let me reiterate. Above all, taking up the shield of faith, or in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith. Those are two different things. And here is perhaps another point in Scripture where the King James Version does not have the latest updates on the manuscripts. If we say above all, that means the shield of faith is over and above all the armor pieces. Correct? It's like what we read in Colossians 3.14. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together together in perfect harmony. Perhaps that is not the right meaning. Otherwise, Paul would have put the shield of faith as the last armor piece to discuss, following his same pattern in Colossians 3.14, if indeed the shield of faith is over and above all. But when we read in all, or in addition to, it simply means in all circumstances, we are to take up the shield of faith. Hence, that is what you read in the literal grammatical translation in your ESV. Okay? 
to remember our premise is that these armor pieces, all of it, whether defensive or offensive, offensive, we are to actively take all of this armor of God up so that we may be able to withstand in the, in the evil day, Ephesians 6.13. Perhaps the reason why I am emphasizing this is that in our human frailties, when we are faced with scriptural truth, our wicked instincts is to select only the truths that we like. Or perhaps we filter and focus only the truths that we find ourselves more comfortable with or feel more convenient with. Essentially, I am trying to reiterate, brothers and sisters, that these armor pieces are not optional. The command is not to select certain armor pieces only for specific occasions and wear other armor pieces for other uh, occasions. All these armor pieces of God gifted to us from God and enabled for our active use by God is a package deal. If not worn together, the armor is weak and in danger of significant malfunctioning. We also cannot have too much of some armor pieces, only to compensate for other pieces we have not or are not actively putting. In this case, we would still significantly malfunction for the purposes that God has set before us. For example, a car generally has an engine, a steering wheel, four wheels, and, and a body. If you have the car's body, you have the four wheels, and the steering wheel you have, but no engine, how far do you think you will go? That's not a trick question. Huh? Or how about this? You have not one, not two, but three massive car engines to overcompensate because you do not have the car body, you do not have the steering wheel, and you don't have the four wheels. How far do you think you will go with your three massive engines? Or something more spiritual. You are so eager to answer any questions about the faith and you are so eager to proclaim the gospel, you have the shoes of readiness and the gospel of peace, you are overjoyed in your heart that Christ has died for your sins, but you have not fastened the belt of truth, you care little about knowing about the truths of the word of God because what is important for you is the emotions of knowing you are saved and loved. You believe these emotions will get you through everything and protect you from the enemy's attacks how far do you think you will remain faithful to the Lord if you never fasten the belt of truth in your life? Or on the flip side, you have fastened not one belt of truth, you have fastened the master's degree belt of truth. And you have also fastened a doctorate belt of truth. I mean, your belt is as fastened as it can be. But the reality of why Christ had to die for your sins and the reality that only His righteousness can save us and not a righteousness of our own is lost in you. You have forgotten to wear the breastplate of righteousness every day, and you depend on your righteousness and take comfort in your own goodness. How far do you think you will remain faithful to the Lord if all you have is the belt? Do you understand, brothers and sisters? Let me tell you a story. This might shock you. Um, we, I think we know the same person, Pastor Nikki. We know someone from a seminary here, great, uh, great teacher of the uh, Christian history. Christian history. He knows this by heart. He's been teaching this forever. Doesn't believe in Christ. Teaches in seminary, seminary, teaches the history of Christianity, doesn't believe in Christ yet. I don't mean to belabor the point, brothers and sisters, but let's face it. 
let's face it, many of us are very much aware of where we are weak. We are where we are disobedient to the Lord and where we have pride. But instead of surrendering and repenting of these sins to the Lord, we succumb to the lies of the devil. Instead of admitting our sins and confessing our sins to the Lord and one another, we attempt to compensate and gloss over sins by highlighting and focusing more on things that we arrogantly believe we are good at and that we are somehow pleasing God in this area. Brothers and sisters, this is a sin. The things that we think we are righteous in, the things that we think we are good in, brothers and sisters, those are filthy rags for the Lord. You see, we try to look at our lives and we stack them up based on what we think God should be happy about with us and the things we would instead cover up from Him. But brothers and sisters, the Lord sees the heart. Unlike man, God looks on the inside and what he sees is a creature that deserves punishment and condemnation. And the only reason he does not look away is because of the righteousness of his son that has redeemed us from death to life. These armor pieces are not so that we can be stronger in and of ourselves, uh, brothers and sisters, as if we were doing the actual battle with our capability. The fact that God needs to gift them to us and the fact that he has to remind us to put them on actively tells us just how weak we are apart from God. These armor pieces are so that we can come to the Lord bearing nothing but our total surrender and dependence on him to transform every bit of our lives to obey him so that as we actively wear his armor, he gets the glory we get ever so consistently transformed daily for his purposes. Brothers and sisters, if we have bitterness or hatred towards one another or malicious thoughts or ill intent about one another, do not think for one minute that serving in a ministry every Sunday will ever compensate or bring glory to the Lord. Do not for one minute think that attending HFGs, praying and preaching in this church, or giving plenty to the church financially will ever replace the armor pieces we intentionally disregard or disobey. Just as it says in verse 16, that in all circumstances, we are to take up the shield of faith. Essentially, this goes for all the pieces of the armor. In all circumstances, brothers and sisters, we are to take up or put on all these armor pieces so that by his mercy and grace, our lives may truly be a pleasing aroma to his name. Amen? How's that for an intro? Uh, Verse 16b, take up the shield of faith. Take up the shield of faith. So what's critical to understand is the shield of faith so that we are correctly taking up what actually needs to be taken up. Okay? If there is one thing that I hope we are learning in our verse-by-verse study is that it is critical to understand terms properly. Whether going into the original languages or understanding the context or audience better or even the history better because often... When we see something in Scripture that we feel we can associate with in our modern-day world, we, don't we immediately uh, just latch on what we have in our mind to it? And we miss out sometimes on the intended meaning in Scripture when perhaps our modern-day understanding of a phrase or a verse or a word is different from what was intended by the biblical author. For example, throughout this series, we have been referring to armor pieces. And depending on what you imagine in your mind and the analogies that you think, or depending on how many war movies you've watched, that may influence how you understand what you will study. Indeed, the illustration given here by Paul is mainly that of military armor, 
which was also the kind of illustration provided in the Old Testament, but perhaps a word of caution at this time. While plenty of analogies can be surmised from these armor pieces, such as how they look, how they were used, you know, I, I read about at least over 10 different commentaries for this. Um, <laughs> some, are, some are still deferring on, on, uh, on the measurements of the shield and all these other things, right? But we must be careful not to go outside the illustration Paul is trying to make. I've heard these sermons preached many times already, and the emphasis tends to be on the armor pieces themselves and how the armor is used or how it was designed historically. And then you totally miss out Christ in all of it. Again, this is not wrong in and of itself, but we run the risk sometimes of putting emphasis or meaning in this when perhaps it's not there. And by doing that, we may get lost in the point of the passage. So what is the point of the passage? What is the shield of faith? Well, the first thing I want us to notice is that this is an active taking up, right? We spoke of this, an active putting on. We know this already. But just because something is true of us positionally does not mean we are to no longer act on it conditionally. Why? Because it's a command and the true natural trajectory of someone truly positionally in Christ will be to move towards what his position already is. For example, this old question, why bother sharing the gospel? If God has elected people, he will save. Well, the answer, the answer is straightforward. Because A, God commands them to proclaim the good news. And B, because true children of God will eventually be unable to contain the gospel of peace, which is true in them that they desire and attempt and strive to proclaim the good news, the more they understand it. It is the only power, uh, the only gospel that has the power of God unto salvation. So while we already have these armor pieces from God, we still strive to take them up and put them on daily. The second thing I want us to notice is that Paul says the shield of faith. Not the shield of the faith. The shield of faith not the shield of the faith. What does this mean? If Paul had said to take up the shield of the faith, then it might mean faith as the teachings of our faith in Christ and all the other teachings in Scripture. But he doesn't say that. He says of faith, which means this is a general trusting in the faith that God has given us to believe in the redemptive work of his Son. Jesus Christ for us. It means when God had said in his word that he would never leave us nor forsake us, or when God said in his word that nothing and no one can snatch us away from him, or that through his son we now have access to the Father, we have now been adopted as his sons and daughters, and that we can call him Abba Father, the shield of faith means to purposefully tell ourselves through Scripture that indeed all that the Lord has said and promised with regards to our salvation, he will keep. Let's break down the essentials of our faith. So we know that by reminding ourselves of these essentials, we are taking up the shield of faith. And we won't go far away from the book, Ephesians 1.7. Ephesians 1.7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Our faith contains the truth that in Christ alone, through his suffering and death on the cross for his children, we have been redeemed. To be redeemed in Christ and by Christ means Christ has already forgiven our trespasses and sins because of his riches and grace. In Christ we are redeemed, and in Christ we are forgiven. Ephesians 3.12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. 
because Christ has redeemed us and we are now in Christ, we now have access to the Father. An access that was lost because of sin and the Father's wrath. But because of Christ's sacrifice, we are reconciled to God the Father and can boldly come to Him confidently. Not a confidence of our own, but a confidence in what Christ has done for us to gain for us, to restore for us, to build for us that access to the Father. Ephesians 1, 13 to 14. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of God. Of his glory. So not only are we redeemed in Christ, our sins have been paid and forgiven by Christ, now we, have, we also have access to the Father in Christ. Now he also sends us a guarantee and seals us with the Holy Spirit. The seal of the Holy Spirit in us guarantees our eternal life. Even before we die, we are already assured of eternal life in Christ. And you know what's amazing? The Holy Spirit sealing us is not done begrudgingly by the Holy Spirit, as if He doesn't want to do this. The Holy Spirit seals us, and this is a promise that the triune God fulfills and keeps for all His children, and all of this gives glory to the triune God. There is nothing that the triune God has provided for us that he regrets providing for us. God's gift of regeneration, God's gift of redemption, God's gift of salvation, God's gift of justification, God's gift of imputation, God's gift of sanctification, none of this the triune God regrets because everything he does is good and perfect which means we can have the confidence to live our lives boldly in pursuit of an eternal life that is already guaranteed for us, even before we acquire possession of it. If you are in Christ today, you are in Christ forever. Ephesians 1.4. I hope that brought a smile in your Heart silent. Ephesians 1 4. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. The Lord promises that because he chose his children from before the foundations of the world, nothing in the world can change what the Father has already ordained before the world. And the triune God has ordained that from before the foundations of the world, you, brother and sister, would be holy and blameless before God the Father because of the work of God the Son for you. And as an over-guarantee, God the Spirit now indwells you as a seal of your inheritance, which is not influenced or determined by what you do in your life, but is already set by what he has ordained before your life in this world began. For the true Christian, this guarantee of eternal life compels us to live holy and blameless lives set apart for him. The question or the argument that if God elects, then people will live carefree lives. These kinds of arguments come from people who do not truly love the Lord. Because if you truly love the Lord, His promises for you and His gift of eternal life for you, which you neither deserve nor can earn, serve as motivation for you to exalt His name instead of a license to blaspheme His name. If you are truly in Christ, then His perfect love for you will move you to love him as perfectly as you can. Why do we have the confidence 
in the faith to say this? Romans 8, 14 to 17. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. And this is why we can all echo what the Apostle Paul declares in Romans 8, 31 to 39. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. And so who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As, is it, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing can separate us from the love of God because there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. These truths, brothers and sisters, are the shield of faith. It is not our holiness that is our shield. It is God's holiness that is our shield. Who God is, what God has done for us, what God is doing to us, and what God has guaranteed for us, this is our shield of faith. These realities we now have in God are the truths we must take up daily. Genesis 15.1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. Say this, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. Psalm 18, 31. For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? Proverbs 30. Verse 5, every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. 1 Peter 5, 9, resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced by your brothers throughout the world. Be firm in your faith. And 1 John 5, 4, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And then you can read uh, in uh, Hebrews 11 all the folks were saved by faith. I think Hebrews 11. You see, brothers and sisters, the shield of faith has nothing to do with your own capability. But it does have everything to do with God's capability. And 
thank God for that. The faith that God has gifted us, the faith that God has guaranteed for us, and God is also the one who shields us from the enemy's attacks. We must depend on God and purposefully remember who God is and what he has done for us. We must honestly believe and be convinced in all these truths, brothers and sisters. It's not enough to believe. You need to be convinced of these truths and promises of God. To truly believe means to truly be convinced, right? And it goes back to the belt of truth. You cannot just believe the concept that Christ has saved you. You need to understand how God saves you eventually. And I hate that I have to break apart the word believe. Because in belief is confidence in the, what you believe. But in our society, it's become so shallow that we have to define the word belief. It's not enough to believe um, uh, the concept that Christ has saved. You need to understand how God saves you eventually. It's not enough to believe you will go to heaven. You need to eventually understand how God makes that possible for you in Christ which means a growing and deepening understanding of His Word. The more you understand doctrine, the deeper you believe. I'm not talking about salvific faith, meaning the faith to believe, because that is a gift from God. I'm talking about the faith to be bold for Christ. I'm talking about a faith that keeps us faithful in Christ no matter what. I'm talking about a faith that keeps us standing firm on His promises when the world is against us, or when tragedy strikes us. It's very saddening today that many preachers and churches think that the more you strive to understand doctrine accurately, the less you believe. But our faith, brothers and sisters, is an objective kind of faith. It is a faith that rests on the truth of His Word. The more we dig into His Word, the more we read His Word, the more we seek the Spirit's wisdom to understand His Word, the deeper our faith becomes. You cannot grow deeper in faith unless you grow deeper in the knowledge and understanding of the object of your faith. And the object of our faith is Christ Jesus. And the only way to know Christ Jesus is through His Word found in Scripture. Verse 16c, with which you can. Now just quickly here on verse 16c, with which you can. I want us to be encouraged by this because what it says here is that by taking up the shield of faith, Paul doesn't say you may extinguish the darts of the evil one. He confidently says that if we take up the shield of faith, we can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Yan ang mga kailangan natin i-observe sa IBS, no? Careful observation. The spiritual armor we are commanded to put on is an indestructible armor because it is God's armor. And so if we are to actively wear this armor daily, we are guaranteed to fend off the attacks of the evil one. Nothing God provides us results in an inefficient, insufficient, or inadequate result. It will always yield perfectly to his his intended outcome. On the side, brothers and sisters, on the side, that's why to say that man has the absolute free will to choose God regarding salvation is blasphemy. Because what that essentially says is that God died for everyone in the world. Yet man has the final say on whether he will choose God. This means the death of Christ on the cross was insufficient and inadequate to truly save and guarantee that the people will be saved because man has the final say. 
it is such a flawed teaching because it essentially says that God died for everyone, but because ultimately man has the final say, then God didn't really die for anyone. Christ's death then does not guarantee life. Christ's imputation is partial only and can be lost, depending on man's decision. And Christ's sacrifice is in vain because man has the final say on whether he truly believes in Christ or not. Be careful, brothers and sisters. The shield of faith, again, is not of our shielding, but God who is our shield. 16D, extinguishing all the flaming darts. Now it says here, extinguishes all the flaming darts of the evil one. Now we know because Satan is uh, not omnipresent, similar to his evil forces, we know these darts are not going to be thrown our way all at once, correct? One time. Although we have days where it feels like we are the center of his attention. Uh, but don't feel too good. Chances are he's not bothering uh, with you. <laughs> okay? But take it as a challenge if you feel you are. So when we read here all the flaming darts, this implies that we will receive flaming darts not just today, but also in the future. This is another verse that supports that conflict and attacks will be part and parcel of the Christian's life in this world. Conflict is always impending. Hence, there is no day, there is no holiday where we can risk not taking up this spiritual armor. There's no such day as, oh, not today, not wearing the armor today. <laughs> Too tired today, let me just, I'm not going to wear it. Let me just do Netflix the entire day. Oops, idle mind. <laughs> you just lost. <laughs> you just got beaten. There's no holiday. And today, particularly the shield of faith, faith, because we never know when we will get the darts of the evil one. In fact, how often, uh, brothers and sisters, have we fallen in sin in moments where we least felt we would get attacked by evil forces? Or in an environment where we least expect it, that's when we succumb to a spiritual attack, right? So we put these armor pieces on daily. You know, brothers and sisters, the church is supposed to be a setting and a venue uh, we often feel should be exempt from attacks from evil forces, right? But because we still have idolatry in our hearts and minds now and then, we end up attributing holiness to an organization or a church. And we think these structures are what will keep us from stumbling. And then so we start having false expectations, thinking that somehow our man-made buildings, our man-made structures and organizations could keep us from attacks. When in fact, it is what is inside us that cripples us most often. And the church is the prized choice of Satan and his evil forces to attack. Because when you succeed in attacking people in a church, they will begin behaving in a manner unworthy of the calling to which they have been called, which would then render the church useless for God, which would then lead to a church being in a bad testimony for Christ, and instead of being a beacon and a buttress of truth unto the world where truth and clarity are supposed to arise from, it now becomes a source of darkness, corruption, and confusion for the community. The flaming darts here don't just mean external attacks from the world, like persecution either through our laws or through social stigmas and modern ideologies. You know, if you guys ever visit Bangkok, it's very dangerous to speak ill of uh, transgenderism or uh, uh, all the kind of genders because that is deeply rooted in their culture. They will literally uh, crucify you if you start speaking in another way uh, with regards to those things. 
So it's, but it's not just those. The, the flaming darts are not just these external things from the world that attack us. They're burning, the flaming darts. Don't we burn for passion and we burn for desires? It also refers to the more constant flaming darts that we face daily, such as temptations, jealousy, envy, bitterness, anger, division, and all these things that could break up the unity of the church. And just to maximize the illustration, which is safely within the bounds of the passage, I think, Paul, again, he doesn't just say darts, he says flaming darts. Parang flaming wings yung naisip ko bigla. Pagutom na tayo. This means there is a destructive burning effect. Hmm. For example, gossip, for example, which by the way is praised in our society. Right? We have talk shows of people whose first name starts with basically a kind of habit that you don't want and then the second name is beautiful in Tagalog. Right? Uh, Gossip, talking behind people's backs, or making false assumptions within the church. This is a dart for sure, but it's not an obvious dart. However, it is a flaming dart because as time passes, these gossips take root. It starts damaging relationships and fellowships, and it starts eating away slowly at the life of the church body. And then it ignites other sins. It ignites other issues that have given birth from this gossip. And before you know it, what started as a small flaming dart has now become this massive flame engulfing the church that it is so difficult to put out. Eventually, the church splits. People leave. People go to court, etc., And this is why we must have the shield of faith to counter these darts and extinguish them, the fire. Because if we do not extinguish them through faith in the triune God, reminding ourselves who we truly are in Christ and what he has done for us, they will grow in size, they will have a negative impact, and they will cause corruption within the body, both in the individual and in the corporate sense, corrupting the whole body. Brothers and sisters, the moment we are, and just on a practical note here, the moment we are made aware of issues in the church, I'm talking generally here, we are to take them all seriously. Many things seem small initially. So we may shrug them off, put them aside, or ignore them and hope they go away. Perhaps you see evidence in your walk, your personal walk, that you are wavering or harboring misdeeds in your mind and heart. Do not ignore that, brothers and sisters. Don't teach your conscience to be numb. We must address it immediately with much prayer and repentance because you never know if that already might be a flaming dart shot at you or us as a church. And if we don't deal with it, these flames will grow bigger and bigger. So let's be even more honest and more accountable to one another, brothers and sisters. This is not a game. This is not not a play thing. This is spiritual warfare. And if we do not all purposefully take up or put on our armor daily, we are exposing ourselves. We are exposing this church to attacks from the evil one, which leads us to 16E of the evil one. Evil one refers to Satan. In Matthew 5.37, it says, Let what you say... Uh, be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Honesty and transparency, brothers and sisters, are the mark of a true Christian, while flattery and being two-faced are not the mark of a true Christian. 
There is nothing more that Satan likes to do than to accuse the children of God to waver in their faith in the promises and truths of the Lord. I mean, this was his strategy as early as the garden. But praise be to God for us who are in Christ Jesus, because this is what it says in 2 Thessalonians 3.3. But the Lord is faithful. He will establish you, and he will guard you against the evil one. Brothers and sisters, we will be attacked personally and corporately. Still, the sufficient answer we have against the accusations of the evil one and the darts that come from within our sinfulness is to remind ourselves that we are justified by faith in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. The faith and all God's promises about the faith he has gifted us protect us from the accusations of our enemy and protect us from our unrighteous ways and deeds so that in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith to extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for protecting us. Thank you, Father, for reminding us today what it is that ultimately we are shielded by, and that is you and everything you've done for us. Help us, Father, to be purposeful and joyful in reminding ourselves of these truths and acting upon these truths in our lives. Help us to have confidence in our lives, to really live and stand firm for you because you are our shield. You are our strength. And absolutely nothing can separate us from you. Thank you, Father God. In Christ's name we pray.